Seminars. Um, that serves our, as our annual conference. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tony Sam George for organizing this uh, and making the technology happen. And uh, also um, want to thank um, uh, our, our current chair, uh, Dr. O Oyasiwo Aluede, who was responsible for organizing the program. Uh, it, I'm sorry I cannot see you or you, or you can't see me at the moment and I can't see anybody else. Uh, but we're having some problems connecting with the technology. Um, I will be moderating today. I'm John Kerry, the past president of uh, the organization, and very, very pleased to be here. Um, tonight's presentation is by two very special people, a very special presentation by two special people. Uh, I think you're looking at a picture of both of them now. This is about uh, seven years ago in the rainforest in Costa Rica as they were leading us through uh, an expedition a group of, of, of school counselors and school counselor educators uh, to explore the rainforest. Uh, today, they're going to be taking us to explore something else. Uh, they're going to be talking about the Venezuelan counselor's experience in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. And the principals, the, the person in front that you're looking at is Dr. George Davy Vera, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Zulia in Venezuela, and also, uh, luckily for us in the United States, an associate professor at Barry University. Behind him, um, uh, physically, but certainly not in any other sense, is Dr. Alfonso Barreto, who is associate professor now uh, at Ashford University in the United States. I have known personally the two of them for more than 12 years. Uh, in fact, I tried to find out uh, how long, but uh, I've known them longer than my present computer, and so I couldn't go back into my records, but at least 12 years. Um, I have been impressed consistently over that time with their ethical commitment to human rights, and access to education for all children. They're profoundly committed people. I've also been um, impressed with their knowledge and their skill in both counseling and leadership. Um, I've been impressed with their insight into the relationships among public policy, research, and practice. And in particular, uh, I think what you can see in this picture is their trailblazing vision into the future development of the counseling profession. I think um, when I want to know what's going to happen in the profession or what can happen, um, I, I talk to these people because they have the ability to envision several possible futures and then to envision what's necessary to achieve the best possible future. And so uh, w without further ado, uh, let me refer you to Dr. George Davy Vera. And Dr. Here, and uh, thank you, Vice President, for making this possible, at, at least in, a, in an online format. Uh, this year has been challenging, but so far, um, I think we made it through. We just have to keep moving forward safely. Um, as you know, we're going to talk about equity and access to quality school-based counseling services. Venezuelan counselors' experiences in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, this is us, Dr. George Vera at Barry University, and me at the uh, University of Arizona Global Campus, which is a uh, former Ashford University. We divided this presentation into two sections. Basically, first, um, I will describe the philosophical and political framework of counseling in Venezuela. Then, Professor George will address how counseling services are organized in Venezuela and how some counseling practitioners are dealing with the current public health pandemic. So um, I will take care of this first section as quick and clear as possible. But first, um, let us provide a brief contextualization of Venezuela. Venezuela is a Latin American country located in the north of South America, just to the north of Brazil and on the east side of Colombia. Um, as you may know, all about oil and gas is the primary economic activity of the country. Uh, it is the country with the largest coastline currency, and it has a population of about 28, 30 million people. The majority of the population is Catholic, even though some ethnic groups practice their uh, traditional magic religious beliefs. Um, it is a country with a rich mixture of races, and when I say mixture, I'm, I'm saying a <laughs> real mixture. Perhaps in some other countries in Latin America, you may see 
blacks or whites, Indians and Asians, but Venezuela is a country in which a rich and real mixture of races happen. Uh, in recent times, there have been some political struggles, but uh, let's hope for the better that this will end uh, soon. Um, with this said, uh, in general terms, counseling services in Venezuela uh, are more related to education than health. Of course, counseling strives for people's mental health or helps people in overcoming addictions, for example, but education is the major bond between counseling and society. In many ways, this is due to the incorporation of vocational counselors in the education system. Different counselors from Europe were incorporated in schools as vocational counselors in the early decades of the 20th century. Years later, um, other influences from U.S. counselors were also focused on the school system mainly. Now, to understand the connection between counseling and education and the social role of counseling in Venezuela, it is paramount to recognize the importance of Simon Bolivar's pedagogical, philosophical, and political ideas. Simon Bolivar was the most important man in the independence war and the configuration of Venezuela as a free state. He thought of Venezuela to be an independent state within a greater union with the countries that are today, Panama, Colombia, and Ecuador. I would suggest Bolivar as the greatest statesman of the American continent ever. Uh, for him, liberty and justice are the ultimate goals of nations, but reaching these ideals will depend on how equal we see each other. This is how we see in Simon Bolivar how um, different political principles are combined and how these determine the access to education. Bolivar had a lot of thoughts that are considered to be pivotal in the education system, but I would say that three assertions that are the core for every educational work or pedagogical process are the following. I quote, the most perfect system of government is the one that produces the higher sum of possible happiness, the higher sum of social security, and the higher sum of political stability. If the principle of political equality is generally recognized, it is no less so that of physical and moral inequality. Nature makes us makes men unequal in genius, temperament, strength, and character. The laws correct this difference because they place the individual in society so that education, industry, arts, services, and virtues give him fictitious, fictitious equality, properly called political and social. Popular education must be the firstborn care of the Congress paternal law. Morals and lies are the poles of a republic. Morals and lies are our first needs." Unquote. When he said light, he was referring to um, he was referring to wisdom, to knowledge. And all these considerations are taken from the Angostura speech of I 1819, uh, and clearly education is a critical asset for the entire system. When I say system this time, I'm referring to the nation, to the country, to the national state. If we approach these uh, thoughts from political philosophy, we saw how Bolivar has opened the door for equity as a form of social justice and inclusion, in which equality and fictitious equality, uh, equality play an important role. When he speaks about equality and the tricky fictitious equality concept, um, he's affirming that in the very first moment of birth, we are equal as human beings, but then we are different in terms of genius, temperament, strength and character and morale. Therefore, laws must create the fictitious conditions in which 
all the people are equal in society. Because of these laws, all men should access education and other rights. And education will be the tool to develop, to develop those different talents and moralities according to the common good. Or, or trying uh, to keep his own words, education would be pivotal in, uh, for morals and lights. And these two are essential in achieving the most perfect system of government as the one that should produce the higher sum of social happiness, social security, and political stability. I would say that it is important to understand that this assertion comes from a state man. Uh, this man sees how social members interact with each other, how citizens and public institutions deal with each other, how private organizations contribute to the good of society if they are managed by moral men, how the armed forces and the civil population help each other and defending and developing the country and so on. Certainly, we might find um, <laughs> Abraham Maslow replying that our needs are very explained by his pyramid of needs. But this pyramid may be secondary in Bolivar as a statesman. In Bolivar, we do not see a professional educator or psychologist. Instead, we see a man that understands society as a whole, trying to guide a free country that is making its way in a chaotic situation. So, philosophically, the education system in Venezuela assumes morals and lights at first need. Then, you understand that individuals need a specific attention educationally and psychologically to, indeed, um, craft them as moral and wise citizens. From this philosophical political basis, the National Constitution of 1999 establishes that Venezuela is a democratic and social state of rights and justice. This is an advanced critical political configuration in terms of the declared national and critical intention to protect uh, life, freedom, equality, solidarity, justice, democracy, in general terms, the preeminence of human rights, ethics, and political pluralism. The constitutional configuration of Venezuela as a democratic and social state of rights and justice is a combination of the liberal state of rights in which equality and individual freedoms are core values with the social state of rights or welfare state, a state in which social ju justice is the most important principle. And all this is according to Bolivar's thought. All this, the constitution um, framework, is what guides education. And as an extension, it guides counseling and the, and the practice of counselors. Every counseling process, every counseling encounter, every counseling approach is guided by their own counseling theoretical framework and code of ethics. But all this, the context of Venezuela, is fought to achieve the higher sum of social happiness, social security, and political stability as a whole. And is also thought to be an educational process. So, in the specific context of the schools, Simon Bolivar's thoughts enlightened the path with ideals of freedom, equality, and justice. The Constitution embraces those ideals, and then the Education Act establishes how these ideals should be carried out in schools. This Education Act of 2009 um, is the law that impacts school counseling the most. Here, Article 6F guarantees counseling, health, sport, recreation, culture, and wellness services to students involved in the educational process in responsibility with the relevant bodies. To the fourth of this article, 
counseling services must be provided at public and private schools. From this legislation platform and besides, considering individual issues, counseling and guidance practitioners are advocates for the development of society and the country. This is how counseling training programs should encourage discussions about the different guiding principles of the Venezuelan society as these feed the pedagogical and social role of counselors. In summary, I would say that the education of counseling and guidance professionals is nurtured by equality, political, and social freedom, as well as social justice, but also by the constructs of knowing and working as fundamental gears to achieve the, constitu the constitutional creation of a robust, peaceful, and happy society pragmatically. We can see how philosophical considerations turn political and then juridical, and finally become pedagogical with social implications. And in every step, the school counseling services are affected. Uh, with this, um, I yield do Dr. George. Dr. George, please carry on. Thank you, Alfonso. So, as you can see, these are the roots of Venezuela counseling, and now let's um, go into a deeper layer, talking about counseling in Latin America and, and specifically in Venezuela in the um, in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as a context, guidance and counseling field in, the, in America Latina, in Latin America, is historically, culturally, and contextually diverse and delivered within a multidisciplinary framework. The case of Venezuela is unique because the historical development of Venezuela um, counseling pedagogical ideas and uh, the counseling service to all the population. Guidance and counseling practitioners in, um, are involved in helping people live healthier lives and thereby create a stronger democratic society. Both of these functions are heavily influenced by policy-related factors. Throughout history, most guidance and counseling training programs in Latin America has resided in university uh, school of education, knowing psychological um, uh, school, um, a college of psychology or any other college. It is college of education. Um, in Venezuela, moving to, to specifically in Venezuela, uh, we can see counseling in Venezuela from early on. In, uh, we can uh, find indigenous guidance in counseling practice in the pre-Spanish colonization. Those um, principles of life, living in society, and preservation of this ecosystem were part of the indigenous guidance and counseling practices in the pre-Spanish colonization. Then, um, in colonial times, counseling practice in, practices in Venezuela were responsible uh, of the school teachers and Catholic priests. Now, in the 30s, institutional guidance and counseling practices began as a form for educational counseling, and these um, activities were concerned with academic, vocational, individual, and occupational issues. This is anti today. And between the 1936 and 1955, the service was um, developed to include mental hygiene and uh, pupil hygiene. This was this was developed. Uh, this was uh, part of the um, the, um, the services that were provided at that time. Now, what is the current status in Venezuela? Counseling in Venezuela. In uh, 2004, the Department of Education and the Union, union representative of all um, educators in Venezuela signed an agreement that creates the platform for developing guidance and counseling activities in the country. And that was the first time that, as a, as a policy state, 
they, they declare counseling as a public interest profession. So the um, political uh, regulations and, um, and services were grant, granted to the population. Um, one of the, the, the achievements of that uh, agreement was that counselors should be hired in every public and private school. So uh, one counselor for every 150 students were available in every school. So you can find counselors, five to 10 counselors in the schools around the country. However, there are not enough trained counselors in the country and there are not enough counseling students at the counseling training programs in the country. So we are needing more training programs and more counseling students. We don't have that much now. Um, how we see it, counseling is um, part of the, is considered as being a part of the uh, a state policy. So counseling is a, for the state policy uh, principle or definition, counseling is a social practice aimed to facilitate the process of human development in the dimension of the being, living, serving, knowing, and doing. In the personal, family, and community context throughout the continuum of life in order to enhance talent and generate process of self determination, freedom and emancipation in the permanent construction of the integral development and well-being of individual and their community. This is how the counseling is defined by the, the state. In the current situation of COVID-19, um, last this year, at the, at the uh, beginning of the year, in March, the state declared a new policy, which is that every home is in a school. Therefore, three goals were established to increase awareness of the school family community to outreach prevention and COVID-19 protection, to activate the educational community movement and organizations, institutions and centers, campuses and education services at the national in order to at the national level in order to ensure the prevention and detection of symptoms and serve the implementation of educational care and health measures, prevention and protection, and many things wrong that to prevent the spread of COVID nineteen in institutional centers and services a national um, in service and national education. This includes all of the all the um, the schools around the country. So the counselors were invited and support to do to do um, and provide counseling services through internet by distant learning, um, delivering, and distant services. So the continuous care and services was, was granted by the uh, political decision, and therefore the school communities are involved in the continuous care of the students. Some of those activities that counselors do in the country are, are related to vocational, to decision, uh, career decision making, and uh, mental health issues. How do we do this? Well, because of the pandemic, the internet is most used. The services, there are some uh, website um, services delivered. They are using um, WhatsApp uh, type of um, app 
and um, emails and chat. So it's a phone home that is school counselors are reaching out to the student population they serve and they work close to the school authority. So what are some of the challenges that we are facing right now? What are some of the challenges? The challenges in the middle of this COVID-19 are training. We don't have that much training in distance counseling and guidance. We need more counselors properly trained to deliver these type of services. So professional counselors in Venezuela, they are now learning how to do, um, how to keep up with the services and provide counseling services using distance delivery methods. Uh, we don't have regulations in place around how to best serve and provide counseling services some of the ethical concerns are not um, are not properly addressed in the counseling regulation, the program regulation. The scope of services, counselors were not trained to deliver these services uh, over internet. So there is uh, some challenging around the scope of, of services. And another thing is the accessibility of internet services. That is not that much um, around the country, not much available, and there are some constraints of services. Well, let's start here and let us the, the audience to share some questions. Thank you for attending this presentation. Okay, thank you very much, George and Alfonso. We appreciate very much the very interesting talk. Um, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, anyone who wants, wants to ask a question can either uh, send it in on chat, and I will read the question, or um, you can actually uh, alert us on chat that you want to ask the question, and I think Tony can unmute you. So uh, send in your questions or comments. Uh, I will read them, or if you want to give them to yourself, please just let us know, and we'll, uh, we'll unmute you. While we're waiting for things to come in, let me ask you, George and, and Alfonso, um, you are both uh, have extensive experience working in two systems, both in Venezuela and the United States. Could you just comment sort of briefly on what you see as the major policy and practice, major differences in, in, in the relationship between policy and school counseling practice uh, in both countries? What a great question, um, Jay. Alfonso, do you want to take it or, or I should do it? Uh, why not both? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you might want to also open up your camera. Yes. Um, great question, Jay. Um, if Venezuela Counseling Guidance Services is part of the culture and is a founding in political um, tradition from, you know, from um, colonial, colonial times in pre-Spanish colonization. We have guidance and counseling principles already in the culture, historically embedded there. In Venezuela, we do have uh, a national body who is responsible for organizing the policies related to counseling and guidance services. Unlike in the U.S., you have many voices here. Um, and um, I'm not so sure, historically speaking, how much back in time counseling guidance services are identified in the U.S. Um, but in Venezuela, we do have those. In Venezuela, by law, counseling services it's a, it's a state policy. Therefore, services to be granted in any school in the country. Because of this, there is funding to hire a counselor. And you can find counselor all the way from 
he didn't got me to the um, our college level. And um, in all this, our funding, public funding based. So I don't know in the U.S. if that's the case. I think it's not. Mm -hmm. And um, it's more part of the culture, I think. It's more part of the political thought to consider counseling as a, um, a profession of public interest. Alfonso? Yes. Uh Another thing that I would say is that um, because of the U.S. federalism, there are differences in the way how uh, counseling is understood uh, in both countries. Perhaps in, in Venezuela, there is a more uh, national uh, accord on how to approach and understand counseling and counseling services. But in the United States, one thing could be uh, Florida, and another thing could be California, and another thing could be Ohio or New York. So there is less homogeneity in the United States than in Venezuela. I I would say that uh, from a political perspective, because of the U.S. federalism, that in Venezuela there is also a a, a federal perspective. Uh, for the country, for the government, but, but it's different than in the United States. So in Venezuela, there is more perhaps standardization, standardizations in, in some things and less standardization in the United States. Hey, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, and I would like to stay on this, but we have a few more questions coming in, a lot more questions. Uh, first of all, in terms of the delivery of services um, and, uh, and, and the challenges to school-based uh, counseling, are, are there any specific challenges that are related to the, to the rural communities in Venezuela? Say that again, Jay. I didn't, get, I didn't get that one. Are there any specific challenges that are related to the rural communities in Venezuela? Yes. Every school has a counseling space by law, but every school in rural areas, they don't have a counseling practitioner formally hired because there are not many uh, counseling available in the country. So there is a, a shortage of counselors. Um, but what we do and what is happening is the counselors for nearby human centers are responsible to go to those places and um, and provide some services. But there is no continual services. There is, there is not in place services. Um, in some places, some places they do have rural uh, counseling um, services available because they hire somebody who wants to live in, uh, in those hours. But yes, there is a short, uh, a, um, a choice of uh, counselors, uh, counseling practitioners in who I am in Venezuela. Thank you. Afonso, anything? Uh, I would say that the main problem of rural uh, populations is the access to internet and and, and the network as a as whole. Well. Uh, indeed, it is a problem that is affecting because of this situation, this political situation, this current political situation is affecting also the urban um, uh, spots. So the access to to internet uh, is is a big problem. Uh, I would say that there are also some other problems um, that are connected to the current political situation and the economic situation of the country that are affecting the country as a whole. So it is affecting counseling services. For example, one of these problems um, is related to, to, to gasoline. Uh, accessing gasoline just to fuel the car is, is challenging 
in current times. So people, uh, those that are in rural and in, in, in rural spots in rural populations, are are finding it more difficult uh, to 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 move around and and do the the standard life that they were uh, doing a few months years ago. Okay, thank you. There's a couple of questions about uh, school counseling and the reentry of students in schools. Um, so could you could you comment? On, are you aware of any places in Venezuela, any schools that are making any specific uh, preparations for the reentry of students? And and if not, or in addition, what would you suggest? Uh, what preparations should be done by individual counselors to prepare for the reentry of students to schools? There are some um, um, outreach community uh, programs that include uh, services to school students who are not in the system that were, uh, for some reason, they um, drop off or they haven't got into the system yet. And uh, in this case, the council, what we, what what is done is to provide that services through community means, through community um, spots, sometimes using churches um, uh, and other community organizations to reach out to those students. Especially for vocational, occupational, and, um, and uh, they call it, let me see the name that is used. It's something related to the reaching out to the undeserved population. So those programs are in place. Of course, this has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and there is uh, an association, it's a work that is associated with also social workers who provide a home uh, visit. The students, receive, they participate in the, in a set of activity and workshops related to um, schooling and to um, educational issues and occupational issues. It's a formal uh, type of program, but they are not that much in place today because of the pandemic. I'm not sure if I answered the question that I was asked. Dr. Mira, does that answer the question? Uh, yes, sir. I I was just typing the answer. Yeah, um, I understood the community involvement that has to be um, made. So I think that's that's very relevant and that's something that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Back back to you, Jay. Okay. A note from a participant, and the note is thank you very much. First of all. And some questions. Do you have experience of questionnaires administered to students to understand what are the needs they have emerging following the pandemic? Are there large scale questionnaires with questions on various topics? And then there's a no grazie, must be an Italian. Deve essere in italiano. Do you want to call it Italiano? Ah, grazie. Grazie. <laughs> Um, if I understood the question correctly, yes, there is um, um, a service uh, survey related to COVID needs that is going on, and that um, survey is um, delivered over internet to parents, and um, they do have meeting with parents online when services is available. And they do have questions related to what type of support the student needs for the schooling, the home schooling, uh, what type of uh, needs are related to um, behavior, you know, um, healthy, healthy relationship because of the pandemic, how to keep healthy relationships. There are um, 
two or three surveys that I, I'm aware of that really targeting into the pandemic situation and the new reality of, you know, schooling from home and taking care of uh, the children and at the same time taking care of the life of the, the, uh, the home. Thank you, George. Do you, do you know if those surveys are public access, and if there's a way that people might be able to get a hold of them? Because it sounds like, uh, even though it's it maybe in a language that people are not using, it, the, the content would be very, very interesting and helpful to people. Yeah, I can try to find out. I saw a couple of those because I received a link, but uh, let me try to find out. I, I have to go back to you about it. Because I know it's sent to uh, parents. So I, I can try to figure it out that one. Sorry, I don't have that information available right now. Okay, thanks. If you can get that, we can figure out how to get that, whether that's on the YouTube page or whether that's on the association's website. But I think it would be something that members, members are very, very interested in and would be very, okay. very helpful. Okay, I will try my best. I do not see any other questions. Uh, hang on. Hang on. Another one in here. Um, do, 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 do. How do you work with issues of access for those who can receive who cannot receive services due to limitations of money or resources? And I imagine that's in general in Venezuela, but also specific to uh, the current COVID situation. Um, services is available to everybody. Access to the services is the major uh, concern because of internet services uh, limitation. But um, free services is granted by the constitutional uh, principle. So every every uh, counseling practitioner who are working in the school counseling, they have to provide services by law. Okay, and, and those services are, are provided free of charge, yes? Yes. Oh yeah, that's a huge, a huge concern <laughs> because it got to be free when you are providing uh, counseling services in the school setting, you are a member, you are paid by the, um, the Ministry of Education. So every service is required by the population, you should be available to provide to, to those needs without uh, charging. Okay, George Alfonso, another um, thank you for a very informative session and a question. Have you come across any ethical challenges with regards to counseling during the COVID era? Yes. <laughs> there are some challenges uh, related to privacy of services, confidentiality, and informed consent. Because of this, uh, and that was one of the, the points that I was trying to, uh, you know, convey that message. Because of the services, uh, counseling services online is so new to the country, we don't have regulations. We do have the knowledge about what should be happening, but the services provided through uh, internet present the challenges of confidentiality, you know? You are providing counseling services in the school, but you are not, <laughs> you are not um, granted the, the privacy to the student because family members are around. Or the full consent, we, we might be providing that counseling service to the a student that might be an emergency, but parents are out of risk. And so there are some, they, those are some of the challenges that I, I'm most aware of. Okay, thank you, George. And, and any other questions coming in? Uh, there is one more question. Uh, uh, let me just 
post that for you. Or, or maybe I can ask the... Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Ask, ask it directly. Ask Good, go ahead, Tony. Uh, uh, Dr. Aditi, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? So the question is, I was intrigued by the idea of politics shaping counseling practice. I'm curious to know about how the counselor deals with clients of privilege. Negotiating needs to be client-centered, yet engaging them in recognizing racial, gender, mm. or other forms of privilege. What's a great question? <laughs> it's a real great question. Do you see that one, Alfonso? Um, the state policy. This is strike. The state policy is related to running the services to the population. Counselors in the counseling, the Venezuela Counseling Association, are responsible to shape what is this counseling about. There is a general understanding about the services, but the specific of the counseling practice is uh, be, belong to the practitioners in their uh, public association. So the politics idea or the principle that um, Alfonso was talking about was more related to the foundation of the the political um, the political principle that sustains the counseling. Uh, professional service to the population. And um, now, for the the client privilege. Uh, Professor George, okay. if you, you let me jump jump in uh, ahead, very, quick. very quick. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it is it is a it is a, a very good question. Um, the point of of, of politics is perhaps it's not politics, but political science, uh, we, we're not talking about political ideologies in terms of socialism, capitalism, or right-wing or left-wing. We're talking about political uh, philosophy, the principles of freedom, the principles of justice, e equality. This is most basic, for example, in uh, the Greek philosophy. Um, we we are, we are talking about political science as the as the science that helps the creation of civilized um, people. So from from that perspective, is uh, uh, is what uh, that that perspective is what fits the the counseling services. How how counseling from the principles. From from the political principles of freedom, equality, justice, solidarity, rights, from those um, political principles, how counseling uh, is or should be involved in the in the in the crafting of of civilized men and civilized women, those women, those men that are going to to uh, to rule society that will rule the country. From that perspective. That, that is the perspective that that we are um, approaching here, not not the, the the right wing or the left wing perspective. Thank you, for So, and the second part of the um, the second part of the question, the services belong to the practitioners and the client. The client has a right to receive the services, and the counselor is by law is available to offer that services. Now they are the ones doing any type of negotiation about what type of services they are looking for, how much that services is uh, is gonna be in those type of um considerations. So um whatever they um they agree upon is what the counseling service is going to be shaped. I don't know if that was clear enough 
if uh, if we were as answer this question, or there are more questions about that, please do so. Thank you. Let me just let me just follow up a little bit, George. Sure. Um, from from our previous conversations, um, I I've, I've come to believe, and and tell me if this is accurate, that uh, that the Venezuelan constitution guarantees everyone the right to a quality education and the right to counseling in order to profit from that education. That is correct. Are are you aware of any other countries that that have that type of uh, commitment to counseling written into their national constitutions? No, in my knowledge, but I do know that we're there before in previous constitution in Brazil and Argentina. There were some um, constitutional articles granting that type of services. But in the modern time, the only country that have that acknowledgement is the Venezuelan constitution. I would imagine then that in terms of policy work and policy research, that that makes uh, Venezuela a very, very interesting place to do work. Yes. Yes, because here is the um, another thing. When you have this constitution right, the second step uh, step is to develop regulations and policies around, you know, how to provide these services, how to provide these services to the population. And right there, we do have a huge gap about police maker knowing about what counseling is. Mm-hmm. So the 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 um, Venezuelan Counseling Federation has been working with some of those police makers in order to raise their awareness about making policies, establishing procedures and regulations based on informed advisement on counseling from the professional practitioner. And somehow that was granted in one of the um, the legal document that I had the opportunity to read, where um, that respect is there. You know, police uh, maker has to reach out to counselors and to get their um, advice about counseling matters and counseling services organization in the country. But it's okay, but it still is to in infancy stage. Okay. Okay, uh, there's another question that's come in, George. Um, greetings to all. I logged in a little late, uh, but what I'd like to know is how popular is counseling in for Venezuelan students and how appreciative is counseling to students in terms of gender equity? Alfonso, you want to try that one? Uh, counseling, school counseling in Venezuela is, is very popular. Uh, as Dr. Ger, uh, George has said, um, there is there, there should be a, a counselor in every school, and every in each counselor in, in those schools um, is is an active member of of the education of of every child. So. So, so, so the counselor is like another teacher, or perhaps the most important teacher, or the most uh, um, or the teacher that students uh, um, try to reach the most. Doctor George. Yes, and they are the leaders. They are the one responsible for a specific um, counseling programs based on a vocational development decision-making, uh, developmental issues, they run all those programs. And those programs are available to the, the whole population, including those who are not members of the school, but the community. Um, they are very, in that sense, uh, we have a saying in Venezuela saying that, what type of counselor do you have when you were growing up? Because mm-hmm. always you're going to have, always, you, uh, you know, 
you enjoy is pulling the uh, gear, you're going to have three or four counseling along the way. Yeah, and and I forgot that that leadership component. Uh, in schools, you you will have social workers, you will have counselors, you will have um, teachers and other other staff. And almost every time, depending on the situation, of course, those 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 teams are led by counselors. So counselors are really uh, leaders in in the development of the school and and the um, and the wellness of, of students. As students and as human beings, because they from time to time have to deal, as I as I said, with um out of school situations and lead the, the teams that are that will deal with those out of school situations. Okay, Jay. Yes, is what is happening in the school that is a crisis or something related to the students, do you know who are the first they call up? <laughs> they call for counselor. <laughs> Immediately, they consult with counselor. That, that, so that's 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 the, yeah, the present is very strong. Okay. Alfonso, thank you, George. There are no more questions, and we are we have two minutes left only in in our allotted time for the session. I want to thank you both very very much, uh, and I'm sure on, on behalf of the membership and on behalf of the leadership of the organization, and on your screen now. Uh, so th so thank you, George. Thank thank you, Alfonso. Any any, any final uh, words that you have? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. J. Thank you, Tony, and the rest of the audience. Um, it's my birthday, so why not celebrate it with an express conference? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Happy birthday, Alfonso. <laughs> oh, thanks. And George? <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Jay, um, thank you so much. I think as the IPRES, we are doing a great job bringing together thinkers and practitioners around the world and share this knowledge across borders and across time and cultures. I think um, conference like this, we need to keep it up and, uh, and promote it every, everywhere. And I hope that soon we're going to have this type of conference in Spanish. So I will have <laughs> friends for the um, Latin American Counseling Network will be able to share with larger audience about counseling around Latin America. And, you know, creating a space for encounter counselors around the world. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, George. From your mouth to God's ears, I hope. Uh, so uh, on your screens now are, is the invitation and the information on the next meeting in the conference series. There is a um, another webinar coming up on January 10th, 2021 uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, at 8 p.m. Hong Kong Standard Time. Um, so you can figure backwards. And, 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 the, and the webinar is from Florence Wu, Mantek Yoon, Queenie Lee, Matthew Chu from the University of Hong Kong. It's an online service for training counselors in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a description of the service for participating students' experiences. Uh, I think a lot of us have been talking about organized ways of preparing counselors to do online work and to supporting them during this work, and this should prove to, very, very, to be a very, very insightful and a very, very, very useful presentation for all of us. So thank you all for attending. Thank you again, George Alfonso. Thank you, uh, Tony, for uh, organizing this. And thank you, Oyashi, for putting all this together. Have a good week. Thank you.